Well, in Tom Sawyer, the classic by Mark Twain, um, in the opening chapters, Tom Sawyer is in a Sunday school class and he is forced to answer the question, who were Jesus's first two disciples? And with courage and vigor, Tom Sawyer was blind, David and Goliath. And with that is an example of David and Goliath being the most famous story in all the Bible. I mean, I mean, think about it. Like it has become its own entity that any time a undermatched team is playing Alabama Crimson Tide, it's a David and Goliath matchup. Or I know it's Olympic season, so we've got uh, you know, the miracle on ice, David versus Goliath. Or if you're into the basketball and March Madness, you've got the number one seed University of Virginia Cavaliers playing against the 16 seed UMBC, David versus Goliath. Or like every fall, you've got Georgia versus Georgia Tech. It's low hanging fruit, I gotta take it, low hanging fruit. But I think you understand that there is this familiarity around this story. Um, but church, if I'm being honest, I think we've gotta be careful when our stories become too familiar. Uh, because it's like that two liter of Coke that you uh, use for the party and then put it on your counter and it kind of sits there and then you take a sip two weeks later, that stuff's flat. And if we're not careful, our story can also become flat. It can lose its meaning. It can lose its punch. It can lose its power if we don't get to the heart of it. And if I'm being real honest, church, as I dove through this story these past few weeks and have prayed through this, I've realized that this story hasn't just gotten flat in my own heart, but in fact, the meaning has been distorted, that it's been hijacked and has been taught in such a way, just in our culture, uh, more out of a Western ideology rather than biblical theology. And what I mean by that is that I've, been, I've heard this story my entire life that, that then there's gonna be a Goliath in your life and if you'll just have the courage to step up in front of this foe, you will be victorious. But in reality, friends, that's really just the American dream with a spiritual twist. And if we're not careful, be it our marriage, finances, relationships, work, that we will stand before our Goliath and we'll be defeated if we don't get the whole story. So what I hope to do over the next 20 or so minutes is for us to seriously consider 1 Samuel 17 and I want us to dig through the gold mine that is God's word. And I want to hand to you three precious jewels that you can deposit in your spiritual bank account. And if we do that, if we can do that together, I believe that we will look more like Jesus tomorrow because we are here today. So if you've got your Bible, and I hope you do, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we're gonna hang out. Um, and here's the other thing. Um, that gold I was talking about, it's yours. Uh, because the Bible isn't just for pastors. The Bible isn't just for scholars. The Bible is for everyone. It's for singles. It's for Marys. It's for everyone. So this is for you. And uh, just as a little roadmap of where we're going, I really want us to think about the battle that David's in, like the scripture we just heard read. And I also want us to think about the strategy. And then lastly, I want us to think about the victory, the battle, the strategy, in the victory. If I was to title today's message, it would simply be the hero. Uh, but before we get there, I would love for us to pray. So if you would, would you bow with me? Um, oh God, we are a grateful people that we can gather together with our church family. Um, Lord, not with an organization, but by individuals who are brought together by the blood of Jesus. Um, and so Father, I just pray over these next few moments that as your word is spoken, that your spirit would be active um, and would penetrate deep in our hearts that we would look more like Jesus. Um, and if you would, in your own seat, um, would you pray? And would you uh, ask God to speak to you this morning? And if you would, um, would you pray for me that I would be helpful to you in that task?
And so Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Goodness, so we have been traveling through the, this, uh, this, this story of David. And just to kind of catch you up in case you've missed, so, so David's uh, a shepherd, he's working in the fields. His dad, Jesse, is like, yo, there's a battle going on. I want you to take a charcuterie board of cheese and meats to your brothers and check in on how they're doing. Um, they've been standing at, at this valley across from the Philistines who they're fighting. And there is this giant named Goliath from Gath who is taunting the nation of Israel and taunting God. So I want you to, one, provide some food and I need a report, like what's good, what's going on. And so it's in this moment that David is standing on the battle lines with his brothers and he sees and hears Goliath taunt for the first time. And speaking of first times, uh, my family has had something new in our lives for the past four or so months. My older brother, um, Kevin, and his wife just had their first precious child. Um, Ellie Kate is her name, and we love her. She's brought so much joy um, to the Ragsdale family. And, and, and it cracks me up because we love to like celebrate all of the little things that she does, like be it how small they are. So it was like the first time it was like, I saw her eyes. Like those little blue eyes, she finally opened them. Or, or the first time she smiled at us or would say those and, or, and begin to kind of mumble. And maybe it's because like I'm a words guy, I talk too fast, I get it, I'm sorry. And, and I'm waiting for Ellie Kate's first words. And I don't know why as a culture we kind of put a lot of weight on those first words. It's kind of like, is she gonna say mama or dada? Like, does she like mom or dad more? If she says ball, is she gonna be an athlete? Like, like we, 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 we assign this meaning to the first words. They're significant. And so I want to point us first and foremost to David's first words. Because David's first words in all of the Bible reside right here in this moment. Sees Goliath, hears the taunts, and here are David's first words. Verse 26, it says this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And with that, the silence is broken. And David speaks for the first time in the Bible. That this is actually David's first public action in front of lots of people as the anointed and assumed to be appointed king. This is his first deal, and what does David do? He introduces a new character to the story. Up to this point in the story, we've got David, Goliath, we've got the, the Philistines, we've got the Israelites, we've got the armies. 26 verses into the story, listen, no one has even mentioned God. That not only are these David's first words, this is the first time God is even mentioned in the entire story. And this is, this is intentional, this is specific. What is David doing? David is introducing a new character into the David and Goliath story. He's introducing God. And isn't it interesting? Do you, do you see that it's not just God, but it's the living God that David believes. Not only does David believe, David knows that this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God who's rescued us from the Red Sea, who's parted the waters of the Jordan. This is the God who has defeated enemy after enemy and has stood here, and y'all, he's still living. So this Goliath, nah, nah, nah. Who, he's gonna be taunting my God, the living God. You see, because for David, God just wasn't an idea of a sky fairy who loves you and dishes out blessings or dishes out curses if you're a good or a bad person. Like David believed in the living God who acted, moved, breathed, and was in relationship with his people, the living God. And so David introduces this new character to the story. Or maybe think about it this way. Um, when I was in middle school, um, I was having a really tough time seeing the baseball. You know, it was at one point this white ball with red laces and it kind of began to turn into a white blur um, that I continued to miss repeatedly. Um, and so mom takes me to Lens Crafters um, on Dallas Highway by the, uh, the OG Otters. And I go over there, the ophthalmologist is like, Cole, you're nearsighted. And essentially she's saying like, you can only see what is right in front of you. You have no ability to see past there. You have no perception of things that are past what is right in front of you. 
And is that not the nation of Israel? That all that they see, they're standing in the valley and they see Goliath. They, they have no ability to see past there. And for me, I remember that day, I put on those glasses and I rode down Dallas Highway and I was like, mom, there are leaves on the trees. Did you know that? The brightest of blues, the sharpest of greens. All of a sudden I wasn't near sight anymore. I had perception to see further. And friends, this is what David has done. He has put on his God glasses that he's not just seeing what's right in front of him. He's not just seeing Goliath. He's not just seeing the armies. He's seeing the living God and he's introducing him to the story. And so gold nugget number one for you today is that the battle is all about God, not David. That it's all about God, it's not David. He even, David repeats himself in verse 36. He says this, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. He's repeating it again and again. This battle is not about David. This is not about David. It's about God. But I think that if we're being honest, going back to our Western culture, making it about God and not about us is not natural. I mean, we live in the iPhone generation we live in the world of selfies and ussies, if you will, and if you watch Ted Lasso. Um, and it's all pointing in to us. This does not come natural, because in the same way that I was nearsighted, that wasn't like my fault, but that was my natural default setting. And in the same way, a selfish, inward-looking life is what is gonna come most naturally to us. But hear me, if you're a follower of Jesus in the room, there is no allowance for it to be about us. Galatians 2.20 makes it clear, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In this life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or when Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's like, yo, if anyone wants to come after me, they should take up their cross and follow me, denying themselves. That, that, that truly Christianity is not about following your dreams. It's actually about putting your dreams to death so that you can pick up God's dreams, which are much better for you. And so the question is, for your battle, is it about God or is it about you? And so can I, can I encourage you? Can I challenge you this morning, church? Would you introduce a new character to your story? In the same way that David didn't focus on Goliath, the Philistines, or himself, he introduces a new character and it's God. So would you, would you consider introducing a new character to your story this week? That when you think about the pains and the struggles or just any circumstance in your life, be it your marriage, let's introduce God into your marriage this week. Let's introduce God into your parenting this week. Let's introduce God into your workplace this week and allow for his desires, his powers, his presence, which we're gonna talk about in a second, begin to fill that space. And uh, so to continue on with some of the, some of the baseball thinking, uh, my mom will laugh at this for sure. Uh, when I was growing up, I was what I would call gear obsessed. Um, I wanted to have the new bat and the new glove every year. Um, it, it, Particularly every year, I would ask for a new bat for Christmas, and then I would proceed to sleep with the bat for the next week. It was very weird, but I loved it. So like, I mean, it was like, my whole idea was if I have the right gear, if I have the right tools, then this will give me the power to perform. Because if I'm using the same glove as the shortstop at Vanderbilt, then I can probably play like the shortstop at Vanderbilt. Or if I can have the same bat as the cleanup hitter for the University of Georgia, then I'm gonna play like the cleanup hitter for the University of Georgia. I was convinced that if I had those tools, I would have the power to perform. And the reason I bring that up is that in our story today, in our scriptures, we've got a group of people who are gear obsessed. Let me prove it to you. So uh, in 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse four, this is a description of Goliath. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, AKA nine feet, nine inches. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was clothed with scale armor. 
which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin swung between his shoulders and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and the head of a spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. Do you notice how the text lingers over the details? that from Goliath's head to his toes, to everything from defensive to offensive weaponry, we see it. This is actually the longest account of any warrior in all of the Bible. There is no more detailed description of artillery than right here in the Bible. And so Goliath obviously has the tools. He's got the gear, he's got the stuff. And so then when David raises his hand, he's like, yo, I'm in to fight. The king being Saul says in verse 38, well then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head um, and clothed him with his armor. It's actually the sentence structure there. It's the exact same structure as Goliath. It's basically tying those two things together. And so Saul is like, yo, Goliath's got the gear. Well, David, we gotta get you in the gear. Like he's got the stuff, he's got the tools. Let's get you in the tools. Let's get you in the gear, come on. But then David's like, no, I can't wear this. And then in verse 40, oh, this is so cool. I hope you grab this. This It's like a fun little detail. And then David took his stick and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which was inside of his pouch and his sling in his hand as he approached the Philistine. David grabs five that description from Goliath. He had a helmet on his head. He had a chest plate of armor. He had greaves on his legs. He had a javelin between his shoulders and he had a spear. Five and five. And what's the text doing but but comparing this ludicrous difference between this massive, enormous, war-ready warrior and then David the shepherd boy with his stones and his sling But then David in verse 45 gives us his secret weapon. Catch this. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel who you have taunted. Piece of gold number two for you. The strategy is all about God's presence, not their tools that David is uninterested in fighting fire for fire, armor for armor. He's like, yo, I'm not worried about all that because I've got God. See, here's the thing is that David actually isn't the underdog because God's on his side. And it's not about the tools, it's about their presence. It's not about what you've got, it's about who you're with. And so I'd ask you in your relationships, marriage, finances, are you concerned about what you've got or who you're with? You know, there's a a way to think about this is, um, I, I would call it the paradigm of power. That if you've got the resources, the money, the cash, and if you've got the experience, the training, the education, and if you've got the stature that you look the look and you, and, and, you can, and you can talk the talk, then you're gonna have power. It's what our world loves. We, we, we love to accumulate power and to use it sometimes, actually most of the time for terrible things. And David, hear this, is outmatched in his stature. He's a small joker against a nine foot nine giant. He's outmatched. His experience Saul's like, dude, you can't fight this dude. He's been trained from a warrior since he was a youth and you're just a shepherd. He's outmatched in his experience. And when it comes to the tools, we got five and five. We're talking about Thanos, the Hulk and Superman combined and the paper boy. He's outmatched, it's a paradigm of power in our culture, it won't work. Goliath wins. But David isn't operating by a paradigm of power, he's operating by a paradigm of presence. God is with me, I go with God. I do not go on my own or on my own volition or on my own power or on my own finances or on my own marriage, I go with God. 
And so I would ask the question today for you, are you concerning your life with a paradigm of power or a paradigm of presence? Are you seeking to accumulate more resources, stature, and experience, or are you saying, God, I'm gonna enter into this room with God? Like, oh, am I gonna enter into this dating relationship with God? Am I gonna enter into my financial conversations with God? Because the strategy is all about God's presence, not their tools. So I kind of have this, uh, this image um, that helps me really think about um, goals and goal setting for my own life. Uh, and, and it's one of a target and arrows. Um, to think about a goal that you have set for yourself or, or the end of, uh, and, the, and the goal of a certain thing is the target and the means by which to get to that target, to get to that end is with your arrows. And so as I was investigating this story, you know, I just began to wonder, why did David go to Goliath? Like, what was, what was his target? What was his end game? What, what's the purpose of David doing this? Like, why does he want to kill Goliath? Is it for his own fame? Is it for his own glory, his own reputation? Or like, like, like what's the end game, Goli- David? Like, what, what's the point? What's the target? And I love that, that scripture is very clear on this. In verse 46, it says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And then skipping down, it says, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And so that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And so David makes it crystal clear. Our target is so that people may know God, that the whole world will know and see that little ruddy boy David defeated Goliath and it's pointing towards this God in Israel saves. This God of Israel is the one. He is the one true and living God. This is our target. And David is pulling up his arrows. This is what I am aiming for. And so back to us, Ackworth, Kennesaw, Georgia, 2021. What is our target? And if I'm being honest with you, my target is not so holy as that. Typically, my target is, and I, w- I would kind of deem this the, uh, the holy trinity of, Western, of Westerners, and it's this, that the target of my life is security, comfort, and convenience. If I can just experience security for me and my family, can I have enough money in the bank account, or, or if I can uh, be, I just wanna be convenient, make this easy, and I wanna be comfortable, and if I'm being honest, I stand here in my life, I grab my finances, comfort. Finances, security. Relationships, convenience. And I'm just firing the arrows at my, of my life at that aim. If I can just have security, comfort, convenience. Security, comfort, convenience. And while those things are not inherently bad by themselves, they can never be our end game. Because David is shooting for that target. You know what would have been the safest thing for David? To walk it on back to Jesse's house, to go home. You know what have been the most comfortable thing for David? Go home. Most convenient thing for David? Go home. But David was aiming his life at what matters most. And so I would ask you today, Honestly, no preacher talk, just like honesty between you and the Lord. What are you aiming your life at? Is it going to matter a year from now? Is it going to matter a hundred years from now? And followers of Jesus, we believe in an eternity. Will it matter 10 billion years from now? And I'm having this conversation with, my, with myself of like, I, maybe I don't need that kind of house because I'm aimed up higher. Like maybe I don't need to be so worried about my social status because I'm aimed higher. Because our aim and goal as followers of Jesus is to know God and to make God known. That's why we exist, it's why we're here. And here's the honest truth is if we're operating outside of that reality, we'll miss it. We'll miss God's best.
the battle is all about God. It's not about us. The strategy for that battle is all about God's presence, that God is with us, not the tools we got. And friends, the ultimate end, the target, the goal, the victory, gold mine number three, is all about God's glory, not our, not David's reputation and not our reputation. And here is the beautiful thing about this. I hope you catch this. If you haven't listened to a word I've said thus far, is that when it doesn't rely on you and it's not about you, you know what you get to do? It's about God, it's not about Cole. You mean I don't have to have all the money, all the resources, all the education, all the relationships to make this a successful life? Oh, you mean that ultimately this isn't all ending in dust? that all my hard work isn't gonna be for nothing, that there's an eternity within it with, with God forever in which every wrong thing will be undone and made right? Like that's what I'm aiming for? It's an exhale, never an inhale. And that's good news. It's good news. And maybe you're not a follower of Jesus in the room today And there is a Goliath and its name is sin. And there is only one who can defeat it and his name is Jesus. And he would like to invite you into this gold mine of truth in which you can live a life of a, instead of a life riddled by anxiety. And because of wherever you sit in the room, believer, non-believer, this is good news. And so we're going to sing in response um, a song that has been sung just about as long as there have been followers of Jesus. And not just in Baptist or non-denominational or Presbyterian or Anglican churches, but they've been sung by Jesus followers across the world. And its simple claim is we want to praise the God from whom all blessings flow. So let's prepare to respond to that. Can I pray for you? Father, I thank you that your word is active and alive and God, that you're alive. So I pray, Holy Ghost, that you would do some ministry right now in the room, that you would um, convict us of our sin, you would comfort us of our afflictions. Oh, and God, that you would just help us to be more like Jesus. And I just ask that every woman and man within the sound of my voice would walk a step closer with you today We need you. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.